Dana Denha here, and this is Let's Watch with the Ann Arbor Film Festival. In a time when entertainment from the comfort of your own home is key, the Ann Arbor Film Festival has gathered renowned artists from all over the world for a virtual celebration of experimental art and cinema. Sean Kenny has been a mainstay at the Ann Arbor Festival for years because of his commitment to his own artistic vision and support of others to create. Sean uses multimedia to create 16 millimeter film loops with the Pickle Fort Collective. Welcome back to the show, Sean. Thank you. Thank you. It's good to be back. So why don't you tell us a little bit about your experience with the Ann Arbor Film Festival, how you, you wanted to get involved? Well, I, I discovered it kind of by accident. I, I had heard about the film festival, but I didn't realize how unique the Ann Arbor Film Festival was. And one day I was on Liberty Street with a friend and we were at the record shop and he said, you should go down the street to the festival that's happening. And I said, well, you know, film festivals, whatever, they're fine. And he said, no, this one is weird and different. You should, you'll love it. And so I went down and bought an afternoon pass. And so my mind was blown. And then I started going every year. It almost felt like a pilgrimage. And um, probably the most important uh, influence for me wasn't so much the films and competition, but the juror presentations, because they have the jurors come in from everywhere, and they're amazing filmmakers. Some of them have been making films since the 60s, and their presentations were so informative. I felt like I was getting a, you know, a degree in avant-garde filmmaking, and they were accessible, and you could talk to them and ask them lots of questions and then technical workshops. And so it just kept building year after year. I kept meeting people and eventually got to the point where I felt like I knew what my niche would be, which has turned into 16 millimeter film loops. Um, and then I, so I didn't enter anything for more than a decade after I started attending. So let's go back to this time where you first are introduced to the festival. Were you making films at this point at all? I was. I was making experimental video down at GRTV, the public access station in Grand Rapids. And that's where I learned to edit. Um, and there was a, a, a young man named Jeff Hudson who produced a show called Nothing Television that used to come on, I believe, at midnight on Saturday. And I started volunteering to help him make his show. I don't quite know what to call his show, except for like, it was a live call-in experimental video remash mix kind of I show. I actually checked it out because I, oh, I had a little rundown of you. So I was like, I'd like to see what oh, this is all good. about. It's, it's very much its own thing. It, it really <laughs> is. And I found that by channel surfing. Um, I was into film already, but I, I hadn't really considered, I, I don't know if I understood that experimental film was so, uh, had so much depth to it. I knew experimental film was out there and the, the films I made were more narrative. They were still weird. I didn't, I didn't know I was an experimental filmmaker. I was making weird, what I thought were mainstream films. Well, you didn't go to school for filmmaking, right? You, no, you have a PhD, no. So this is something that you sort of became a hobby and that became more of a hobby over time, more than right. a hobby over time, right? Yes. Yeah, definitely became a hobby. And, um, you know, my thought back in, in undergrad, I had considered going into art just in general, but I went for psychology instead because it seemed like a more practical career choice. So I got my doctorate in psychology, started working as a psychologist in private practice. And, well, I started working for the county first and then private practice, which did allow me sufficient free time. And I'm sure all artists know that the thing they don't have enough of is free time to do their art. And money, uh, you, it gave you and money, money to do it. Yeah, it gave me a comfortable enough income. That was my diabolical plan the whole time. <laughs> was, how can I make enough money, but not work 40, 50, 60 hours a week, um, because then you just don't have the energy, even if you find the time, if you're, if you're drained from work. Um, and then uh, channel surfing it, in, I think 1995, I discovered Nothing TV and it was a moment and I volunteered for the show and Jeff started teaching me to edit the way he edits, which was a very 
at the time we were going VHS to VHS. But I can uh, see his sort of style in your style too. Like I can see yeah, that you've sort of yeah. like, he helped shape you as well as the film festival. It's interesting mm -hmm. how like your artistry has been shaped in the last like decade or so, because when I look at your work, you look like you've been doing this your whole life. Well, thank you. I, I think um, maybe that's where my brain has always been, but I didn't realize <laughs> quite how to, I think as each year has gone by, um, it gets more refined. So the 16 millimeter loops are really, um, you know, everything has kind of led to that point. But yeah, Jeff Hudson. So my stuff mainly was video for more than 10 years, I think. Um, and of course, you know, the, the digital revolution in filmmaking kind of changed the game. So the tools changed. Yeah, um, for sure. Yeah. I mean, I can, when I first started at CTN, we were still using um, mini tapes and now it's like, oh yeah, I can't even imagine using a tape now. It's funny. I know, I know. <laughs> it's funny. We do some classes here at the Pickle Fort Film Collective. Actually, we did a, a Grand Valley has a professor, Anal Shaw, who is also an Ann Arbor uh, filmmaker. He does uh, experimental documentaries. He brought his class over to teach them handmade 16 millimeter loops um but he um he the the influence from grand valley has been has changed and they like to these students who are like 20 they want to use vhs because <laughs> they're like it's so cool this is so funny because my husband just mentioned this and we're going off on a little thing here but my husband just mentioned yeah. to me that now the music industry is moving back to cassettes and i was like yes. what is the advantage yes. there's no <laughs> just got one yeah. that's a local artist say all all these i call them kids uh these kids are releasing everything on cassette and luckily part of the uh the mission the pickle Ford film collective has various uh, goals one of those is to keep a working form of the previous technology so we have working vhs we have 16 millimeter projectors we have super 8 projectors we have maybe kind of an 8 millimeter projector that half works um you got a laser the, disc got a laser disc and we got a laser disc with a karaoke machine. Built. Oh, nice. I didn't even know that was a it. thing. <laughs> I didn't either. It just got donated in the last uh, year or two. And it I came know it sort of makes you think like, why did I get rid of my VCR kind yeah. of thing, you know? Yeah, yeah. It does. Uh, there are advantages to the older technology. But of course, the minute you start editing, um, I love film, but to physically cut it and splice it and put it together it's like oh please can I get a digital transfer <laughs> yeah I've never done that you know when I was in school they weren't doing it anymore we were digital already oh, when I was really? in college so you know when I talk to my oh. husband we have the same schooling background we went to different universities but we had yeah. the same education similar educations he did a lot of film stuff but he's you know eight years older than me and oh, by the time go. I got there mm -hmm. it wasn't and we were not we never I don't even think there was a class at Wayne State that offered it at the time. Oh, that's too bad. Well, you know what you have to do is come to the pickle for it and take a hands-on 16 millimeter. I think class. I would love it. It's so, it looks like so much fun. And you know, I have an art background too. I I um have a math or a fine art degree, a bachelor's in fine art, and I I it, like can see it. You know, I, it's like you're almost like a painting when you're creating. Yeah these 16 millimeters, each yeah. frame is like a different painting that you're creating, which is pretty Yeah. Sweet. Actually, so... speaking of which, why don't we just take a quick look at one of your 16 Good. millimeter creations. Let's watch this visual and sound experience with a pickle fork collected hanging on your wings. You're hanging on your wings.
Follow the bells underground. Okay, you're falling. You're, you're falling and, and you love it. We're back with Sean Kenny, and he's discussing his creations with the Pickle Fork Collective. Um, the sweet thing about the Pickle Fork Collective that you were talking about before we actually watched one of your 16 millimeters is that you're teaching people how to make these too. Yes, yeah. It. Um, we like to, it's kind of a joke, but it's kind of serious that we, we've created an adult Montessori program that involves not just 16 millimeter loops, but also then um, you can't quite see it here, but the whole room is set up to then perform your soundtrack live while your loop is playing because the loops are a typical loop is about 10 seconds long and we'll often do two projectors at once. But then once you've made your film, then you can come up and grab some sort of it doesn't have to be an instrument, anything that makes sound and we'll do the, you know, live cinema is kind of uh, all the rage these days, but. Um, so you're not necessarily a musician, you're just making what feels right to you in sound wise. Yeah, I consider myself less a musician and more a soundscaper, if that, or yeah. Yeah, I can see that. And I, I kind of feel like with your sound specifically, I get that sort of your actual background of being a psychologist or a psychiatrist, I'm sorry. Oh, nice. Nice. I can kind of feel that, like, I don't know, there's some sort of like that human touch to yours too, that I, I can yeah. feel while I'm watching. Yeah. And, you know, I try to keep one of my rules for myself as an artist, you probably do this too. It's nice to, it's nice to limit yourself. Um, I try to use electronic sound, but start with an organic recording. So like bird sounds or wind or human something that has that human component to it mm -hmm. and then bring that into the digital world and you can shape it and bend it and, you know, do fun stuff. I'm not a huge fan of just computer generated sound. Not that there's anything wrong with it, but. Um, to each their own, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And recently uh, this year's festival, I don't know if you want to go in this direction yet or not, but sure. We're wherever we're, you want to take uh, me. Oh, good. We're, um, <laughs> So the films that I've had in the festival had pre-recorded soundscape um, tracks on them. So this year we're hosting an after party where you'll be seeing loops, multiple loops happening, but then we're also gonna do the live sound performance and there, this year's gonna be a little more danceable. So we're oh, bringing yeah, in- Yeah, I did read that, it, oh, a term that I had never heard before that you uh, was used to describe, which is hadnotic. I had to look at the urban, urban dictionary. <laughs> right. I stole that. It's not, I'd love to say I made it up. It, um, I discovered it on the, the app Pandora. I don't know if you've used Pandora. Oh, all the time, yeah. 
it finds music for you and it describes all the characteristics and they would describe things as hypnotic beats. And I was like, Ooh, that's pretty good. I mean, when you look up the definition, it completely makes sense, but I'd never seen the term before. I didn't even know it was a real word. I thought it was just kind of a, it's a pretty cool word. Yeah. I, I would run yeah. with it. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> So why don't you talk about this idea of like when you're creating, so you're talking about the sound aspect, but what about how you're manipulating the film? What are you using? Uh, All kinds of stuff. Um, and are you using found footage as well? Yes, yes and yes. Um, so you can, when we teach a class, we start people off with clear film leader, which is just a blank canvas. It's easiest to use something like a Sharpie or india ink if you paint if you paint on film with india ink number one the colors are just beautiful um but we will also sometimes start with black leader which has an emulsion on it that you can then scratch off so it's more of a removal process and recently well not so recently but in the past couple of years we we've, we've been using bleach so you put bleach on the black leader and it pulls off layers of the black. And what I discovered quite by accident was um, some black leader is made up of layers of green, red, and bright yellow. So when you bleach it, depending on how long it sits and you take it off, you'll get a bright red or a bright green or a bright yellow. Oh, yeah. So my first film that I entered that got in the festival, um, Astral Atomic, that was all bleach on black leader for the most part. Um, and so, for example, last night the students were here and we give them all kinds of tools. They can also use one of my favorites is you can put uh, a type of glue on the clear leader and then sprinkle it with, say, sugar or salt or something colorful like curry. Uh, and then it sticks. Now, the uh, the film, the the projector people. <laughs> don't want to show my films in their good projectors because oh, it's it'll got, like ruin it <laughs> yeah it doesn't really ruin it but it's not they have to clean it all out because it gets filled up with sugar and um yeah but luckily the grand rapids public museum donated like three of their old projectors to the pickle fort and so we have enough projectors and we've learned to maintain them enough that we can we can show food films and um <laughs> The uh, the other advantage of the food film, which it's uh, part of the experience of being in the room, is you start to smell what's on because the bulb heats oh, up. Oh, because it'll film. get warm. Yeah. 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 So you can smell the curry. I did one using mole sauce. I cooked the film in a pot of mole sauce. And then I served it up after the show. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> right. And it smelled like, oh, hey, we're having some some mole chicken or something. But yeah. Anything, kind of anything goes as long as you end up with a loop that will actually fit in the projector and hasn't been too damaged. Um, I, I once taped a loop, I covered it with glue on both sides and then I taped it to my bicycle and I rode around and let it flap in the wind and it picked up in the summer, you know, you've got this stuff floating in the air, the pollen and the oh, dust yeah. particles. Yeah. And it just picked up what was in the air. Um, yeah, little bugs even got caught in there. But um, yeah. So your brain thinks a lot about film and like the things that you can do with film and stuff. And I think it's pretty right. evident in another one of the films you shared with me, which is uh, Perforation Jubilation, where it's this idea of freeing the film, like a film yes. is a person that needs to be free. Yes. Yes. Well, it was it was more specifically freeing the sprocket holes <laughs> or the perf holes, because the perfs, if, if you're really into film, what you realize is if your perf holes get damaged, you're screwed. So the perf holes are the hard workers because they're pulling the film through and they you don't get to the normal view of a film. You don't get to see the sprocket holes. So I felt like they are the unsung heroes of filmmaking and, and perforation jubilation was a their chance to be on screen and, and get the leading role. I love how you think, like I said, like it's like film is like a human being to you. It's like your buddy. Right. <laughs> it's great. So why don't you talk a little bit about the Pickle Fort Collective? Is this just you? Are there multiple members? Can people join? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So 
Um, you can always join, at least for the time being, through Facebook. I won't go off on my political rant about Facebook, but we have a the Pickle Fort Film Collective is an open group. I think we have about 150 uh, members. Most of them are either from Grand Rapids or from Ann Arbor. Um, but the Pickle Fort started off, I'm going to say 2013. Uh, the, the short version is after the housing collapse in, in 08, a bunch of homes in my neighborhood were abandoned and stayed abandoned for years. And I was paying a lot of rent in a big building to rent a studio. And it finally dawned on me, I should just buy one of these houses. So I bought a house that's four doors down from my, from my proper house. And, um, it immediately became a hub of activity and a core group of about five of us started working on the house and kind of reconstructing it into a micro cinema performance space. And then one thing led to another and we started getting uh, 16 millimeter projectors were getting donated and film. I have a friend that goes to flea markets all the time and he would bring me all this found footage and we started cutting it up and painting on it. A lot of it was really old and it would break when we projected it. And that kind of led, the loops kind of occurred accidentally. I knew about loops and I, had, I hadn't really thought about using them until the film kept breaking. So we decided, well, we'll just, you know, we'll splice the ends together and paint on it and put it in there. Um, so the, that was the beginning of the Pickle Fort Film Collective and now I'd say with our connection with the Grand Valley Film Program, there's, we probably have about 20 active members. And we pre-COVID, we would get together once a week. Um, and we'll probably get back to at least once or twice a month once we can have larger group uh, gatherings. But yeah, it just kept, it kept going. And then when I showed in Ann Arbor and I did some talks and I was on your show, more and more people have joined the Facebook group. Um, and it's really cool because you just, uh, I think people are naturally, there's something about the Montessori approach. Uh, it doesn't matter if you're six years old or if you're 60, it, it seems to draw people in. It, it uh, feels open, like you can do it. And you can't, you can't make a loop you can't really um, do mess it, it wrong. Yeah. yeah, you can't really mess it up. I mean, the worst thing that can happen, like I made a loop once where I was gluing uh, grass to it and it was just too thick. It just wouldn't play. Um, but then we put it on a digital transfer table and took individual shots of each frame. So even if your loop doesn't work- You can work still make your loop work. Yeah. yeah, you can still find it, yeah. So rumor has it that you're doing a virtual workshop this year for the Ann Arbor Film Festival? Yes, we're doing a virtual uh, build your own loop workshop. Um, someday we'll open a store on Michigan Avenue in Chicago, like the, the Build-A-Bear, and <laughs> we'll make millions. I hope so. <laughs> Wouldn't that be great? Um, but yeah, I, I don't know when, I think they're going to put that out there as soon as I get we'll put the, the, you know, they can check out the website to find out when that'll be, but yep. you can go to the Ann Arbor district library to get all the supplies you need to take part in that workshop, which is pretty awesome that um, yeah. you can head on over to the AADL for any supplies you need and you can, and this is a virtual workshop. So anyone can join. Yeah. Yeah. And I think I'll, I'll put out a short video on all the basics and then maybe we'll add if you want to get even more complex, because some folks, uh, you know, artists come in all different shapes and sizes, they really want to animate. So they'll take the clear leader and a Sharpie and draw like a bird or a human figure. And now it's hard to do because it's about the, the frame is about as big as your thumbnail. Yeah, you need a really fine tip point on that, I'm sure. Yeah, and you need some glasses that are oh, yeah, magnifiers yeah. <laughs> so you can see what you're doing. <laughs> Uh, and I believe the Grand Rapids Public Library is also doing some version of the same thing where they're going to give out uh, a, a piece of film and a self-addressed stamped envelope. So the night of our after party that we're hosting, we're hoping to show those film loops that people complete. And, and I think they're going to mail them right to the pickle for it. That's my understanding anyway. Oh, that's awesome. So you're uh, loop that you're creating with you prior to the festival will actually be a part of the festival. Yep. 
That's the goal. Yeah. That's really now, exciting. That's like a really great goal to have. And I think that yeah. really makes people want to take part in the festival more, you know? I think so too. Cause you know, everyone loves a film premiere. And even if your film is a 10 second loop, um, it's really cool to see it up there. And they used to do that at the festival. Um, they would put out some clear leader on a table and people could draw on it throughout the course of the festival. Um, and then they'd show it on the closing night. We'd get to see what the audience made. And I always, I always found that to be really engaging and cool. You know, what's really exciting about all this is that obviously the festival is virtual this year because it has to be, but it's right. still like you're helping to make it interactive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like that too. I like to feel like the audience can participate somehow in some way. And, um, and then they can see their, the fun thing will be that you never quite know what your loop looks like until you project it. Like you have an idea in your head of what it might look like, but until you see it on the screen, you won't know. So the audience, the person who made the loop, the artist is going to be surprised at their yeah. own work. Yeah, that's a, that's pretty cool too, that you have no idea what you're gonna, it's almost like um, painting blind. Yes, yeah. And it's revealed to you um, years ago, there was, I don't think it still exists, but there was a super eight festival in Kansas city and you would shoot a single cartridge of Super 8, which is about two minutes, and you were not allowed to process it yourself. You had to do all your editing in camera and you'd send them the raw uh, film, they would process it, and then you show up for the festival to see your own film for the first time. Oh and I, thought, I thought that was really a cool idea. It is, it's really cool. Yeah. Well, before we go, obviously you love the Ann Arbor Film Festival and you've experienced it for many years. So you've got some insight. Why should people really take advantage of it this year? I mean, anyone can take advantage of it because it's virtual. So there's no, you know, you don't need to be in Ann Arbor. Yeah, yeah. I That's, that's probably the biggest reason is that, you know, to travel to Ann Arbor, the film festival is really reasonably priced compared to a lot of festivals, but you know, the travel and finding a place to stay. Ann Arbor is not a cheap town to, to rent a room. Um, although you can usually find, you know, somebody will let you sleep on their couch if you really want to go. Oh yeah, they uh, do. They, the film festival actually offers programs where uh, families host people. Yeah, yeah. And this is just, um, it's a way to see films that uh, you will probably not have a chance to see I mean, it's getting better where the, it used to be experimental films. If you didn't go to the festival, you'd never get to see them. And now you can see something that somebody made in South Korea or Germany or Russia. And it's uh, probably an artist that you haven't seen before. And it's right there in your living room and you can pop your own popcorn. Yeah, that's a, that's a, that is definitely an advantage. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you, Sean, for coming on the show. Thank you. I appreciate it. And uh, yeah, I'm very excited. To watch this and other CTN programs, visit youtube.com slash CTN Ann Arbor. Remember to like, comment, and share. I'm Dana Denhofer. Let's watch with the Ann Arbor Film Festival.